explaining why Americans should care about what's happening. Of course. In Ukraine and the Nebraska Republican joins us now, actually. Bobby Bowden said he went up to a huge Nebraska player before the first time they played him and said, son, what's that on, in on your helmet stand for? He goes, knowledge, sir. And Bobby said, that's when I knew we were sunk. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, Senator, thank you for being with us. I wanted to, I, I wanted to just kind of get your feel for the people you represent. Uh, I think most Republicans have been responsible on Russia, even while Donald Trump was saying crazy things during his presidency. The Senate, t one tough sanction after another. I'm just concerned as an American about the base. Are they hearing a lot of this nonsense about Putin and Ukraine and it doesn't matter who wins or loses? And are you finding some of your constituents are actually buying into that? Or is the base still sort of the Republican Party of... Ronald Reagan and Gene Kirkpatrick and Margaret Thatcher? It's a fair question. Uh, obviously, Joe, but most Americans aren't paying attention to global affairs most of the time, and that's not, that's not a disparagement. They've got to be raising kids and putting bread on the table. So I'm pretty sure if we pulled it, a majority of Americans wouldn't be able to find Ukraine on a map. And when they're passively not attentive to it, that's all right. It's in a moment of crisis. How do they respond? And obviously, there are a bunch of clickbait voices that want to exacerbate isolationism. Uh, I don't like to give oxygen to clickbait because it gives oxygen to clickbait. But I think, ultimately, um, Americans are going to make a wise and smart choice about understanding why our rooting interest here should be against the evil Vladimir Putin, because the guy's got big-ass weapons, and he's evil. You could think he's a genius and evil, or you could think he's a madman and evil, but the reality is he has a lot of weapons and he has a lot of will, and so we have to care. So I, I want to read you what the Wall Street Journal editorial uh, board wrote this morning. Some Americans will want to concede Russia this sphere of influence and say it's Europe's problem. But a world in which Russia dominates Eastern and Central Europe, Iran dominates the Middle East, and China dominates East Asia will not be safe for U.S. interests. Regional powers have a habit of becoming global threats, especially when they work in concert as Russia, China, and Iran are already doing. Obviously, those three countries are a grave threat to global yep. stability uh, and to future problems. What do we do now? I know, I know you weren't pleased with the first round of sanctions. Uh, I think a lot of us thought they didn't go far enough. I'm curious, do you think uh, the second round of sanctions are moving in the right direction? That's, and, and then second part of my question is, how do we get Europe to move along further on, on oil and gas? And how do we get them uh, to move along further on tougher sanctions for banking? Yeah, great question. And let's let's talk about the to-do list because it's long. But potentially, if you have time for it, let's come back to the, the China-Russia alliance because it matters a lot. Um, but what we should do right now is, first of all, um, the intelligence community did a good job of getting intel out faster than they usually do to help deny Putin the pretextual cover for what he was going to try to do. Ukraine isn't a threat to Russia. Putin's a liar. He lies all the time. But he usually gets away with it. And the U.S. intelligence community helped thwart that this time. We need to keep that up and we need to get tactical, actionable intelligence to the Ukrainians on the ground so they can kill the Russian invaders. Number two, we need to be arming them to the teeth. So President Biden should be coming to the Congress right now asking for an emergency supplemental for defense spending. The administration cut defense spending last year. It was a bad idea then. This isn't the time for recriminations. The question is, what do we need to do now? We're not going to put boots on the ground in Ukraine. We shouldn't. We don't need to. They're willing to fight, but we need to arm them. Number three, to your sanctions point, we need to do more sanctions. We need to do them faster. There's no reason to hold the swift sanctions in reserve. That should have happened yesterday. It should happen today. We need to get it done. But fundamentally, we need to have targeted sanctions at the 16 oligarchs, the, the mobster cronies who enable Putin's madness. These guys, we, we need a made-for-TV lifestyles of the rich and famous assholes for the American people and people around the world to understand who these guys are. We need Germany to step up on energy sanctions. There should be Nord, no Nord Stream 2 ever. But frankly, we need the Brits, who have been great allies in general, we need them to step up and acknowledge that there's a ton of Russian billionaire money bouncing all over London, and we ought to perp walk those people out of the country. Their kids ought to be kicked out of the schools that they're in in London, and they should go back and live in Moscow's hellholes with Putin, because they're the ones enabling him. They don't want to live with him, but they love to make money off him. And there need to be more consequences for them, and we need to act faster. Well, that's another uh, Wall Street Journal editorial page, uh, editorial about Boris Johnson's week 
uh, weak uh, sanctions. He doesn't go after the oligarchs that basically are propping up a good part of London's economy. I'm curious, how do we put pressure on them? How do we put pressure on Germany, as you said, to move f uh, faster and swifter on, on sanctions? And also, uh, obviously, we can't unilaterally decide to move forward with the swift sanctions. How do we get Europe's buy-in mm -hmm. there? Right. It's a, it's a very fair question. We don't want the SWIFT sanctions to end up being something that we put pressure on and then Europe uses it as an excuse to try to mediate or moderate between us and Russia. So we do need to bring people along. But there is not nearly the urgency at the U.S. Treasury Department and the U.S. State Department that there is at the intel community and at the Pentagon. So we're not leading those discussions as urgently as we should. Again, SWIFT is being held in abeyance when those conversations are, should have been advanced two and three weeks ago pre-invasion when we knew what Russians' intentions were. To your point about the Germans, I get that the German political leadership has a hard problem when pushing half of their, their populace is pacifistic, but we've got a real problem with Berlin, with Berlin and German executives around the world who the main thing they want is to lust for money from other countries regardless of whether or not they sponsor genocide. We see this with German business being willing to constantly deny the fact that we're living through a genocide in Xinjiang. The U.S. needs to bring along our people and our allies to say idealism and realism can go together. We should idealistically care about the suffering of these Ukrainian families, but we should care about it not just for them, but because it's in our and Europe's realistic interest for Putin to know the world stands against him and we're willing to suffer some consequences if the economic sanctions are costly. We need to cut him off from the global financial system. Senator Sass, uh, the Biden administration is watching right now. Can you be specific? And I just say that they watch the show. Can you be specific about the weapons? Uh, because we, we talk generally about needing to arm the Ukrainians with defensive weapons. It's something that Barack Obama didn't do in 2014 until late in the game. Uh, what do we need to do specifically? What weapon systems need to be sent to the Ukrainians? That's the first question. The second question is, how many U.S. troops should we put in Poland? How many U.S. troops should we put in Estonia? Well, to your, to your last point, I compliment the fact that the administration acknowledged we need more troops in Germany and Poland over the course of the last 72 hours. It's happened twice, uh, and the administration is making the right choice. Again, I want the American people to understand, because there's a bunch of clickbait isolationists out there who pretend we're talking about putting ground troops in Ukraine. Nobody is talking about that. We're talking about putting troops in our NATO allies to make sure per Putin doesn't cross those borders and to make sure he doesn't see uh, NATO and, and U.S will as a paper tiger. So we need more troops in Western and in Eastern Europe getting to the edges of NATO border territory. But at the level of what weapons, I, I think it's probably best to let the Pentagon officials make those arguments. But we've seen in the past with javelins and stingrays, going back to 2014, we've never been urgent enough. And we need to make sure that none of the Ukrainian resistance fighters have any fear that they're possibly going to run out of ammo. Just real basic level stuff. you got grandmas trying to defend high rises around the outskirts right. of Kiev this afternoon. And those folks need to know there won't be some dumb bureaucratic answer that says, well, we put in the requisite request form and then that had a process where there was mm -hmm. a CR and three and six months later, we still didn't get around to it. There needs to be an urgency and the president needs to lead on that by saying, the president should make the announcement today to your question about the administration officials that he's gonna send up an emergency supplemental request for defense spending because they underfunded the Pentagon last year. We need to make sure they aren't short of cash as they need to get weapons to the Ukrainians this week and this month. David Ignatius is with us. Uh, David, uh, oop, uh, actually, oop, oop. I, I actually, I think we, we lost his picture. So uh, I will ask you, we'll circle back to the China question, uh, Senator Sass. Uh, the Chinese will not call this invasion despite the fact uh, they understand economically uh, their economy slowed down, there's zero COVID uh, uh, a policy has been an absolute disaster. Uh, Omicron sweeping across Hong Kong and, and will soon sweep across the entire country. They are not in a strong position, and yet they seem to be siding with a country that has a GDP that's smaller than Texas instead of uh, the United States and the EU, whose uh, GDP uh, is well over $40 trillion. What do we yeah. do? 
So, first of all, when you asked at the beginning of this segment, um, what do Nebraskans think or what do conservatives think on the ground, one of the sort of reasonable arguments you'll hear people say is, but isn't China our long-term threat? Isn't the expansionism of the Chinese Communist Party the number one geopolitical threat of the year 2030? And I think the answer to that is yes. And that, therefore, means not that you can be indifferent to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, but that you should be mindful of the fact that this invasion was green-lighted by Beijing. Russia has 11 time zones, and they were able to move their troops from the Far East back to Belarus to be able to invade not just from their Russian actual territory in the East and the Crimean Sea's territory in the Southeast, but they invaded from Belarus as well, and they're encircling Kiev as we speak. That was able to happen because they moved the troops back because she said, hey, I'd love it if you could help destabilize Europe and the U.S. And by the way, I'd love you to be the scout team offense on what a cyber hybrid war looks like, so we, China, know what it might look like if we try to seize Taiwan. She greenlit this thing, and the American people and our European allies need to understand that. It's really difficult uh, to think of anything silver lining-ish out of something like this when you got moms and dads, uh, the eight males 18 to 60 are all being called up to service, and they're trying to load a lot of their wives and kids into cars, heading as an em emigrant uh, you know, bandwagon heading toward the Polish border in the West. And in the midst of that sadness, it's hard to find any silver lining, but one of the small ones is you have a bunch of European capitals where in 2010, when NATO last wrote its strategic plan, they agreed to leave the word China out of it because there were so many people wanting mm -hmm. to make money in Beijing. I don't think the next strategic plan, it was delayed because of COVID, NATO's strategic plan will probably be written this summer or next fall. Um, they're not gonna leave the word China out of it anymore because they understand that Chairman Xi is interested in Russia destabilizing the West. All right, Nebraska Senator Ben Sass, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. A lot of great points made. Really appreciate it. And this news just into end.